uh, now that other she, other base is but is, a, is upon us. And next week, you come wearing costumes, and we bring wine. <laughs> There'll be a whole different sheer. Did we record it? We don't be recording. <laughs> yeah, better be because we won't remember. Right? Every every port is recorded. <laughs> In case you, unless you didn't know that. Uh, this is kind of partially devoted to, to how to get uh, the most of the pouring, how to, how to actually celebrate the day properly, and what the focus should be. Uh, this book is designed uh, to also facilitate that redemption, redemption, which I happen, I just happen to have some copies with me this evening. Uh, I like to sell about fifty thousand for a pouring, so if you know anybody, you know, just anyhow. On a more less serious note. The um, the Mishkan, Parshat Pekude, normally the Yatat Pekude come together, this is the leap year, this book actually is called Mesamach Gula Lugula because it's actually very appropriate, this year is a leap year, in fact, very shy to the book of the Sefer itself, because the Gemara says in, in Megillah on Vav Amad Beis, what to do in a leap year, right, normally there's only one Adar, and, uh, you know, Purim falls in Adar, so it comes close to Pesach. But in a year, it's a leap year, so you have a choice of Adar Rishon or Adar Shein. And the, and it's, it's a real Chiddush. It's actually quite a Chiddush that we do in Adar Shein, because normally we have a concept of a Marvin al Mitzvahs. And that means basically that we do a Mitzvah the first chance we can do a Mitzvah, we do it. We don't, we don't push it off. I mean, especially look at the situation today. The world's so volatile that between Adar Rishon and Adar Shein, the whole world could just change. Before you know it, you, know, like, you can just imagine how had one week sitting there thinking, well, we could do Purim this week without a problem. It's safe, it's quiet, and everything, the Makot's up, and you can, it's fun, you can do, go to the streets and do Mishlach Monos. Within two weeks, the whole world can change, and all of a sudden, you're stuck in your, your Miklat. You know, Chas you can do Purim properly at this point in time. So, like, why, why take a chance? It's certainly in the situation in, in the Middle East, and there's Israel, and, you know, but we have this, this other concept, which is actually a very interesting idea, because it's not really a, a mitzvah, per se, rather it's an Indian. And the Gemara says, Masama Gula la Gula, that we'd like to put one Gula next to the other Gula. So normally, even though it's true that other in a, a regular year, a non-leap year, that you only have one other, that four will fall in the month after Shvat. And the month before Nisan, because they're sandwiching the month of Adar. But in a leap year, what do you do? So the Gemara decides that we should do it in the second other instead, which is why we have not yet had Purim as of this year, at this, this, this time, because of this concept of putting one Geula, one redemption, next to another redemption, which of course we know what we're talking about, because the next redemption we're talking about is Pesach. Right? So Purim and Pesach should go together. And it's, it's more than the fact that both begin the letter pay, although there is something to that, for sure. It's very important. Uh, but uh, the question is why? Why is it so important? So the obvious shot, the obvious explanation is going to be that you need Purim for the sake of Pesach. You can't do Pesach properly without Purim. And two months separation is just too much. One month separation is, is enough. Two months is, t- is too much. And it's not just because Chazal wanted it to be that you had less time to get involved the Vafali that your kids spread throughout your house after the Shlach Manas was over. Right, there's some kind of like saboteur out there who basically sells waffle specifically one month before Pesach so that your kids can go ahead and make a huge mess just after you began your early cleaning for Pesach. And you have all kinds of signs, don't go upstairs, this huge trail of, you know, waffle. Now it's more than that. Chazal had more serious things in their mind when they admitted that one should be close to the other. And you can kind of compare it in a sense like a person who has, wears glasses, right? We weren't born with glasses, thank God, because, because that would have been tough on the mothers. But uh, instead, what happened was that we we start up with the average person starts up with normal eyesight. Actually, it's not true. <laughs> you don't. But eventually, you develop normal eyesight. Babies can't see that much. They can't see very far, right? When they first come out, you know that's why the first thing they say is, "Where am I?" And then you know, "What's for lunch?" But after that, you know, they 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 their eyesight starts to develop. And at some point in time, everybody, for the most part, is equal. It's very unusual to see a young child with glasses. You do see that once in a while, and it's almost a very strange, it's almost cute, actually. But unfortunately, it's not a you know, positive thing because it means their eyesight already is going, is going. But for the most part, people start up with normal eyesight. What happens over time is that it starts to deteriorate for one reason one or reason another. And usually it's hereditary. Not usually. I think it's always hereditary, I found out. Even though we've been told, don't read the dark and... You know, people who read small print will lose their eyesight faster, 
and uh, right. I have it on word from a professional, top class world professional uh, ophthalmologist who lectures all over the world. I think he was one of the first people to do laser surgery in the eye and all that as all wants to. So he's pretty, he's pretty much uh, an expert as he said that basically it's hereditary. The only reason why people read small print tend to have their glasses earlier is because since they're reading small print, they're the ones who notice their eyes are out of focus earlier. The rest of us are reading big prints and things like that. Don't notice as much when your eyes start, start to go. And I have a story about that, but not for now. The... Um, how I solve my fear of driving at night when I realized I required glasses, but that's another story. The um, the point is is that as time goes on, you require glasses, and the glasses they they enhance your vision. After a while, as you get older, your eyesight starts to go, and your and your your glasses compensate for that, for what's missing, for what's lacking, so you can see more more clearly. So when the Jewish people first left Mitzrayim, and even then they weren't clear about about divine providence, about how Kosh Baruch Hu runs his world, and which is the same thing, but uh, one's in English and one's in Spanish. The, uh, and, and, the, and, how, and, how, and how we're supposed to function in this world, and, and you know, what's our role as partners in bringing the Gula Shlem, because we, we blew it the first time, we blew it the second time, the third time, we're still blowing it after all this time. So, but it's still, the experience of Yitzhiz Misraim was still, was still fresh, and still real. You can imagine that the first, well, actually the mid by the end of the, Celebrity patient, but eventually when they got there to Israel. Forty years later, it was still a pretty fresh experience that uh, those who survived the Moraglim that you, know, you knew what you were talking about. It was like first hand experience. It wasn't like our ancestors once a long time ago. And for those who believe and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, here's what happened. It was like we we know it. We just came out of the midbar. We know what took place. We know the the Nisim took place and the Mara, and the uh, and the Makos took place. It was a real reality. So Pesach also was a real reality in that, that time. But as the hundreds of years started to pass, eventually thousand years started to pass, the Jewish people began to lo- lose emotional touch. And it's a really remarkable thing, because that's how the emotions work. It's, you know, time, as I say, time healed everything, but it has, it's a double-edged sword. Time heals things, and also time causes damage over a period of time. If you don't keep up a relationship with something, eventually you just start be- to become desensitized to it. And it's an amazing thing how you could have a very scary experience, or you can watch something very emotional, and for the first two days, you know, it'll be real to you, and you'll feel it. You can ev- evoke emotions about it, maybe for the first few weeks, depends on how deep the experience was. It could be for the first year. You still can evoke emotions and feel, and put yourself, you know, back into that scenario. For somebody, I just was speaking to somebody I haven't spoken to about 20 years, and this person remember an experience we went, we went through back as, as book, you know, way back, way back when, and I guess it mattered a lot more to him than it mattered to me, because it stuck with him and not with me, in the end. He goes, remember that time we did you know, X, Y, and Z? He's like, you see, like, you know, the, the laughter and the emotions are all, like, starting to well up inside of him, like, he's, go, he's reliving it right now, as he's telling the story, and I'm going, no, what was, what was that about? Oh, I remember something like that. You know, yeah, was, whatever, you know, let's move on. Type of a thing is go, what, what, what do you mean? Let's move on. It's like that, that was a real experience to me. Well, he he <coughs> remained in, in touch with him for whatever reason, and it stayed with him. Likewise, the Pesach experience was real to the Jewish people for the first period of time, and, and emotionally they could connect because they, you could talk to ancestors, and even those people, even though the generation that entered Israel for the most part was a new generation that was born in the midbar, but still they were born in the midbar. And even though the next generation of the next Israel was born in Israel, but still they spoke to people who lived in the Midbar, they spoke to people who were Mitzrayim, and it was, this goes on for a period of time. And z- therefore, there was an emotional connection. How many people emotionally connect to the Yitzhiz Mitzrayim experience today? I mean, how, how, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do. So, as a result of that, we began to lose it. In fact, one of the questions they ask as to, as to why we wear costumes on Purim, there's a few explanations, but the Gemara gives one specific explanation, and that is that we didn't really believe in Haman or any of Zorah, or we didn't really want to become like the, the Babylonians, you know, per se, but it was more of an external thing because we we're afraid of an appearance. We we're afraid to appear that we weren't one of them. We we're afraid to appear that we weren't, you know, going along with Achishver. So therefore, externally, we masqueraded as people more loyal to the king than we actually were. So Kodesh Baruch Hu said, that's also not so good, you should know, because there's a thing called Chil Hashem and, and, and Morris Ayin and uh, all these very different things. That, I must do so many more Ayin, but anyhow, all these different things that, that can, can cause problems in life. <coughs> I know. 
from Kirtzah that were serious all year long. We could throw a few little things here and there, just to like lighten up a bit. You should wait till next week we have some wine. That's a whole different story. <laughs> what you don't do, by the way, just so you should know, I'm, I'm sure you're perfectly aware of this, but you're really supposed to drink wine on Purim. There's a real Indian to drink wine, specifically on, on Purim, because the whole miracle happened through wine and all that, as we'll see. Don't use scotch. Anyhow, so wine. Wine is the drink of choice for a variety of reasons. But the, the first the, the first question we just asked, well, first of all, and if there's the connection to Pasha Pekude, because the they're extremely and in, in, intimately tied together, the Mishkan and the whole Purim story. And uh, again, the book explains it in more detail. If you want to see it you know, for yourself, you can look inside. Uh, but the basic idea is that the Mishkan was set up, you have a, the Chatzor, you have a curtain around the entire area of the Mishkan, which was uh, 50 by 50, it was, it was the, the, the Chatzor inside, first of all, there was a, there was a Masach, right, across the opening of the, of the Chatzor, of the, uh, what do you call it, the, Olmo, the, the whole thing was called the Olmo, right? the whole area, there was an opening to get inside the area there, and there was a, there was a, a screen across it, there was a, a, a what do you call it, a curtain across, which is 20 Amos Y. And all these numbers, of course, are completely significant, and extremely significant. They're all tied to Purim itself, which we'll see in Hanukkah too, for that matter. But uh, once you got past the Masach, you walked into the Chatzar. The Chatzar itself was 50 Amas by 50 Amas. We learned the Halachas of Erev from that, basically. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a base of Sayin, which is the amount of area for, for the, um, that you'd have to have, you know, if it's a non-inhabited area, that more than that, you can't metal to something in that area. That's the halachas, where the, where, that's the area that we, was a, that, that uh, constitutes a private domain, before it becomes a public domain beyond that. Then you got to the opening of the, of the actual Mishkan itself. This is what was called the Hechel, right? The sanctuary. So that was, that was 20 by 10. <coughs> 10 armors wide, 20 armors deep. That's where you, for the first on the Chatzor, that's where you found the Mizbech Hachitza, right? The main, the Mizbech. Where they put the carbonus, the big, you know, big, big huge uh, base, which was 32 amas by 32 amas uh, in, in, in width uh, square, right? With the ramp, the whole thing. And then beyond that, you got to the Hechel, and there was an opening there, and that was 20 amas deep by 10 amas wide. And uh, you had the you had the the Mizbech Gatoris inside there first, and then on the right hand side, you had Black Apadim, and the left hand side towards the south. You had the menorah, and then you got to the parochas, right? After 20 amas, and the parochas, of course, separated between the, the Kodesh and the Kodesh Kodeshim. Kodesh was the Hechel, the Kodesh Kodeshim was where the Kohen God went once a year inside to do the, do the, the, the um, Avod and Yom Kippur. And that's where the Aaron and Kodesh was inside, where the Gemara says it took up more space than was physically allotted for. There's a big miracle that happened inside the Aaron, inside the, the, uh, the Kodesh Kodeshim, and that was that the the the, um, by the times the wings and the, the groove and spread out and all that, that it really shouldn't have been able to fit, but it fit anyhow. The whole place was, was Lamal and the Temple. I mean, the mission of Pirkei Yavah speaks about the, the, different, the different miracles that took place in the base of Mitzvah, which also took place there as well. But uh, these actually correspond, these four areas correspond, the fourth area is outside the, the, the curtain. Right? Beyond the curtain, that's the everyday world of the Shmat, the, the, <coughs> the Shvat, I think I already started drinking before I came here, but the Shvatim, right, the first you have the Machana, Machana Shechina, and the Machana Levian, and beyond that the Machana Israel, Israel right, and, and uh, they all were set up. You know, you can take a look in the living to actually now there is called too, you can look inside there and diagram the half of these things. So the four areas. The four areas are outside the entire complex, right? That inside was the chatzir, was the first area, then come, which also went towards the back as well, but that's the main area, the, the front part, because the back was just part of the servicing of it. And then you had the Hecho itself, and then you had the Kodesh Kodeshi, right? The Kodesh and the Kodesh Kodeshi. Those four areas correspond to Kush Baruch's name. Yud K Vav K. So the, obviously the five which correspond to the ten sphirot, right? So the ten sphirot going from Ches, going from Keter all the way down to the Malchus. And uh, the Malchus, of course, corresponds to the everyday physical world in which we live in, which is the world beyond the the Ohel Amoed, right? That the beyond the curtain, right? That's the that's the hay. The Vav corresponds to the Chatzar inside, which is fifty amas by fifty amas, and this first hay which corresponds which corresponds to the the six Sfirot, we call Zer Ampin of Chesed through Yosod. And then you go into the, the, the Kodesh, which corresponds to the first Hay, which is Bina. 
And of course, the Yud, which corresponds to both Chachma and Keter. The Yud, the body of the Yud, corresponds to the sphere of Chachma. The coats of a Yud in, in, in <coughs> Safrus, in the Sefer Torah, it sticks up a bit. That corresponds to the Keter. Now both were, were, were in the uh, Kodesh Kodesh Shim. That's the way it's basically set up. Now, we know that Galus Bavl lasted 70 years. And in fact, the whole story revolves around the 70 years. It's an amazing thing we take for granted. The entire story, the mixture for all these different kings, where they would, they would do things and use the, the kalim, and the base of Mikdash, and dress up as a Kohen Gadol, and things like that, and they were making a statement. There was, a, there was, a, there was an issue that was being dealt with over here. It was not Stam just a Galus. The, the Galus at the beginning was not like the Galus at the end. Towards the end, it got cheap. It's just about killing Jews now, about, about anti-Semitism, and killing, and stealing, and, and all kinds of terrible things. But the beginning, they were more biblical. They were more, they were more connected, more kashur to the Torah itself, and history. Right? Nebuchadnezzar, because he showed covet to Gosh Baruch Hu, so he got covet back. They were aware. They had, they, they, they were, he was friends with, with Zachary in the, in, uh, 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 was it Zachary? Yeah, Zachary. No, not Zachary. Zedekiah uh, in the beginning, right? They, there was, a, there was a, a relationship there because they believed in the Jewish people and their destiny. And the, and the, the what, was, what was being contested in Bavl was whether or not the Jewish people still were connected to Kodesh Baruch, whether the Torah was still valid or not. That's what Yeshaya says to B'nai Israel. He says, get Christus. Right? The Jewish people thought that was it. Because, you know, it's like the first time, for example, that you do something wrong, and you say, that's it, my parents are going to kill me. No, no, they no, really kill me. No, not just punish me. They're going to take my life away. They're going to, like, take a knife or something. <laughs> you know, and you survive it. And the second time, you're a little bit less free. The third time, it's like, ah, don't worry, they'll get punished, we'll be back again two weeks from now. And this is the way it goes over the rest of your life. So, B'nai Israel, the first time they were exiled, thought, well, that's it, you only get one shot. So, you try to tell them that's not true, go ahead, build houses, marry off your children, settle a little for a while, you'll be here for some time, but uh, there's no get creases over here, the relationship is going to go on. But the whole point was, is that true? And that's what Akashver was, was, the point he was making, by dressing up as a Kohen Gadol, he was making the point that that the Jewish people are no longer loyal to Kushbor or, or don't have to be loyal to Kushbor because Kushbor is no longer loyal to them. And what was the proof? What was going to be the the, the main proof that a Kushbor who had actually abandoned the Jewish people was whether or not after seventy years that the prophecy of redemption would be fulfilled. So Daniel had a prophecy about that. And Yeshua had a prophecy about that, and they, everyone knew about it, and they're all making calculations. The Gemara speaks in Megillah about the various different calculations and where they went wrong. Because we they weren't, they weren't 100% sure of the starting point. Only once the Gula took place, we could retroactively go back and say, well, that must have been the starting point, because then we see what the ending point was. So, it's an amazing thing. Why would a Kodesh Baruch Hu make it so ambiguous? And then, okay, so for Bitochon Amuna, to see how loyal we're going to be, etc. But the emphasis on the 70 is quite clear. But somehow 70 is extremely important. And we know it's extremely important because the Gemara in Erevin says that anybody who's able to drink and have Yeshua Das, behave like a mensch, become a better person. Not a lesser person, a better person. Anybody who can do that has Das Kona, Das Akainin, of which there were 70, right? And the Gemara says, why? Because when wine goes in, sod comes out. As Rashi explains, the gematria of yain is 70. The gematria of sod is 70. Right? So therefore, one equals the other. So that it, we learn from this that, that 70 represents the wine plus the ability to use it in a more positive way and become a better person. The Gemara on ayin, of, ayin alaf, of al, al Dafim and Sanhedrin. Right? You're like, it's, was one of these in their Moshe Hashkacha Pratis in the end. No, we don't want to do that. We know they're Hashkacha Pratis, but the really, really important and central Hashkacha Pratis, they have a, a whole Gemara talking about wine and Eitzit Sephara, Dafka on the, the Daf that corresponds to the number that represents the, the wine itself, is pretty significant. There's a few places where this happens, where the Daf itself, the number of the Daf corresponds to the Indian and the Gemara that's uh, it's, it's been, it's being spoken about. But the Gemara says that wine is really reserved for, for a velus, for, you know, to comfort those who, in a velus or a shy. One of the two. So the question is, it seems like a stira over here. Well, we'll have to see if that's true or not, because really, the deeper Pshah the Gemara, now, hopefully we're not Rashaim, 
and hopefully we'll never be bevelous. I mean, it's part of life, but there's a, there's a touch to this Gemara. The Gemara is talking about something that applies to everybody here, both aspects of it. The Rishas part and the, the Avelis part, which is what the wine's coming to fix up in Bava specifically, which is why it's 70 years long. When you look at the Mishkan, it's a very interesting thing, because you come to the Masach. Now, 20 is always a very significant number, because, oh, look at that, it's the time. The, uh, so the Masach of 20 Amas wide. 20 is a very significant number. Where does 20 show up? It shows up a few places. It shows up, first of all, that that's the age a person is supposed to get married, because according to the Zohar, that's when a person gets their neshama, which means that's the point to get a person that gets their seicha. And from that point onward, the Gemara says, anybody who doesn't get, does not get married by the age of 20, their bones should rot, or their bones will rot in the end, because basically, a person goes down spiritually, downhill from that point on. Today, the rules don't necessarily apply. Today, 20 is more like about 50. People mature at the age of 20 by 50, if they're lucky. Lucky, not 50, 40, 30, whatever. But, <laughs> but the, uh, it's, you know, it's like not, you know, 20 is like young today. So you can get married at the age of 20, 22, 23, 24 also. But there's a message behind the Gemara. A lot of these Gemaras have messages behind them. The message is what, is what counts the most. Now, the real place, the 20, makes it, is significant. The Gemara says in Shabbos, and this is Hanukkah related as well, because Hanukkah is the other side of the Kohen. Not the Kohen, the Kohen. Right? Cause, you know, play a word, Kohen. Right? Come on, guys. <laughs> okay, take it back. <laughs> Thanks. It's the other side of the, of the Kohen, and they're both two different aspects, right? Because the, the grog you spin from below, we learned from Tamil and Hagi, because because it was a different hashkafa practice, but Mordechai Esther, Mordechai specifically, he triggered the whole guru. We had, a, we had a spin from below, and Shemayim spun around us, responded to us, basically. Chanukah, you spin the dread of Mon Top, because the Kosh initiated the events, and we responded to that. But it's just basically two different you know, forms. In fact, if we have more time, we can go back. It's also in the book, too. It's all in the book, guys. It's always in, you know, in the good book. And, uh, and that's basically the machlokis between Yosef and his brothers, what's going on the entire time. Because Yosef is, Yosef is saying that really it's a time, it's a more of a pouring time back at that time. Meaning we have to initiate. No, the other way around, sorry. The brothers were the ones who were saying that it's pouring, meaning we have to initiate, so therefore they're, they're the ones who destroy Shechem, right? They're the ones who destroy Shechem, destroy Shechem against the will of Yaakov. They sell Yosef. Without telling Yaakov, they're, they're 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 making things happen on their own because they believe that's what a Kishbor who wants from them. Whereas Yosef is saying just the opposite. This is a time where Kishbor who's making things happen, and we have to, have to respond to that. And that was the Machalokas. And in the end, who won? Of course, Yosef won. The, the proof was that they were forced to undo all that they did, come down to Mitzrayim, and as they say, Kishbor was the one who's making all this happen. Yehuda is Moda and Parshas then the Parshas Mikates. At the beginning of Pashat Yigash, that we thought that we had this thing under control. And of course, when he says, Ani Yosef, that just put the whole thing in perspective. And they realized they were pawns in someone else's, in someone else's game. And that's when they realized that Yosef was right. It was really Hanukkah, Hashkacha. But they're really two ideas. It's the flip side of the same concept. So, the Gemara says that there are three things that cannot be higher than Chof Amos, which happens to be 20 Amos, Right? One of them is the menorah, because ain't, ain't a shot to bay, the eye can't see that far. By a sukkah, you can't have it, the, the, the schach, 20 amas, because then the shade will come in, hit the wall, and not you. So therefore, you won't be sitting the shade, the shade of the sukkah, but rather, you know, this is the sukkah itself. And the third thing is an Arab, because the same idea, because you have to be able to, to see, you have to be able to see the Arab to know where the Arab begins and ends, and since the eye is weak, but the, we can get around that problem, because you can build a big menorah. Right? Chabad solved that problem. Right, because you can see their menorahs, I think, from the moon. Last I checked, <laughs> with binoculars, right, and uh, and an air of two. You could build a big, you know, a big, huge air. We use a thin wire, but you have a lechi and all these different things, and you source of pesa. You, you can make it visible from higher than twenty. Um, so obviously, the twenty is going to be more significant than physical distance itself. So it turns out the twenty represents a spiritual blindness. 20 is the number, we're not talking about physical blindness, but spiritual blindness. It represents the idea of, of not being able to see the hand of a Kodesh Baruch Hu in everyday life. So that's why the Masach was 20 Amr's why? To indicate in the world beyond the Chatzar, in the natural Tevedic world, you know, for those of you who have my connection, 
my partial sheet, you'll see, uh, which is like the scientific point of view where you look at the world and you don't see Kodesh Baruch That's what the Masach represents. Your blind Tashkacha practice. The brothers say, as Yosef is approaching, let's see what happens to the Bala Chalomus, right? Let's see what happens to his dreams. Whether his dreams will come true or our dreams will come true. As Rashi points out, the first part of the statement was then. The second part of the statement was Hashkach, was a Shechina talk. Why would they add the words, you know, let's see whose dreams come true, ours or his? You're about to kill him. You plan to kill him. You know what the answer to the question already is. Ours will come true. So what are you adding that for? So therefore, it's a like who's saying, let's see whose dreams come true, yours or his, my, or mine again. And they don't see it. And the very next thing in the Gemara, in Shabbos, after the Halach of 20 Amas is, Habor Reik, the Ein Bom Mayim. The boar was rake, had no water in it. The Gemara says, classic Gemara, Medrash, everybody knows this, but the Gemara asks the question, if the boar was rake, of course it has no water inside. Why are you stating the obvious? So the Gemara comes back and says, Mine aimbo, the kraven, the nechashim yeshbo. To tell you, it's a mute, it's a mute and a ribui, to tell you that there was no water inside, yes, but there were poisonous snakes and scorpions inside the pit. So what? So Yosef survived all that. So what? Okay, we know he's surviving by miracles. Arabs come down, selling what? Normally they sell oil, going all the way, not just today, going all the way back in the beginning of history. They went into kerosene, oil, you name it. That's their thing. They like that stuff for some reason. But they, uh, they, were, they always sell that stuff, says Rashi. This one time, they're selling basami. So Yosef is going down to meet Surah in comfort, in a good smell, but he says, he should have to smell something terrible. There's a very important reason for that too. It's not just like, you know, a comfort thing and a courtesy of Shemaim, where they give you little, you know, wet towels to make yourself, you know, wash your hands, like, you're going to meet Surah, and you have to present become a slave, you might as well smell good too. You know, and also, you know, you're going to be put in the slave and treated like a slave, but why should you have to smell bad things along the way down? And it's like, you know, there's a reason for all that. Just like Moshe Rabbeinu also in the, in the Teva too. Did the brothers notice that? Did the brothers stop for one second to say, well, wait a second, you know, miracles are happening. Look in the pit, the pit's empty, there's no water inside, because you put them down, and you're like, you're dropping, you know, shekels inside, or whatever, stones, and then no water, no water, right? You know, because you don't hear him go splash. He's not going, yeah, get me out, there's all kinds of water, and splash, you know, there's no water down there. The first thing a person should say, there's no water down there, there must be vermin down there, there must be terribly poisonous things down there, and yet Yosef is not getting killed, the Kutch Borch is obviously saving him. Why would a Kodesh Baruch Hu save a Russia? And now he makes a nice smelling wagon train of Arabs go down, right? And even the Arabs smell okay because of this as well, because they're all, you know, selling this stuff. And Yosef is being treated like a king. Why? You know, maybe we're missing something. Maybe there's something we're not seeing over here. No, they're totally blind to it. And they get, it's, it's their own trap in the end that they're setting for themselves because they're blind to this. That's the Masach of 20 Amis, right? So 50, as the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, the world was made with Nun Shari Bina. Moshe Bain received 49 from birth. He never got to the 50 because the Gemara implies and the pre says and he's a magistrate that the 50th, the Nun, the Nun Shari Bina is reserved, is, is reserved for Ebali Tshuva. In fact, the pre says in Parshas, the Varma thing is where he, he says that Moshe Bain before he died said to Bnei Israel, you can achieve that which I can't achieve. You can get the 50th get of understanding, but I can't. Because I'm, I can't be Baal Chuv. I never did a chet. Nothing that, to speak of. So therefore, now he got it though when he died. How do we know that? Because where did he die? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he died at Harnavo. Harnavo was Nunbo. On that point he got it, right? That's what he got in the Shika. And the Shika is Nun Shaka, right? Which means that you're, you're drawing right, the, from, from the Nun. Just like Nedder is Nun Dar. These are all things to do with Nun Sharabina. Purim is all about the Nun Sharbi, which is why Haman chose to build an eight, 50 Amas high, because, as the priest explains, he was trying to stop an influx of the Nun Sharbi <coughs> into history at that time, to allow the Jewish people to be the the proper way. He wanted to stop it, so therefore he built the, 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 the eight that high, an allusion to the eight dust of a rub, which is also the Nun Sharbi. And instead, he wasn't, he was unable to stop it, but the point was, was that, uh, it happened instead, and, and Claudius Rebbe were transformed because of it. And that's the Chatzar, 50 by 50. 
the Nun Sharabina, the, the specific purpose of the Nun Sharabina, the basis of Torah, is to allow a person to be able to see the hands of the Kajborch in life and history. You get to the Hechel, but it's also 20 Amas deep. What about the 20 over here? So the answer is because there's a difference between the 20 before the Nun Sharabina and after the Nun Sharabina. I'll give you a mashal. The best mashal, for example, is a person says, I will go to Yeshiva, I will learn Torah. And this is what people do. I mean, when I was in, more involved directly in Kiru, so people would come through and they'd say, wow, that was a great class, I really understand it, it was important, I enjoyed it, the whole thing, it's true, i got to do it, but I'm going back to college first. I'm going to go to college for two to four years, and then when I finish college, I'll come back to Yeshiva. Mm, you can bet on that one, basically, with almost certainty, they won't come back. Rarely do they ever come back into that. Rather, instead, they go back to college, and they lose it all. If a person says, I'm going to go back to college, says, no, you know what, maybe I'll go to Yeshiva first for a year or two, and then go to college, and be better prepared. I go to college then. And the person does think you should have first. Then, <clears throat> even when they go back to college, not only does the college not damage them, unless you get a professor who tries to undo the whole thing, which happens to somebody I know, but it enhances the experience. A doctor, for example, someone who learns medicine, right, and goes back and, is, and, and learns about the body and how the body functions after being in Yeshiva for two years and comes to believe in a Kosh Baruch Hu, Rosh Prati's, Looks at medicine and says, wow, look at the miracle. I can't believe this is what God did and how it's so fantastic. And so, so you know, the moment of heaven, it's so mysterious and all that. The, the knowledge that medicine enhances his connection to Kishboch. In fact, that was the whole point of the of the Yitzhak Tovah in the first place. Kishboch, as the reason points out, was not saying that out of you will never be able to eat from the Yitzhak Tovah. He was saying, don't do it before eating from the Yitzhak which apparently was Shabbos. If Adam, this is right from the result, if Adam HaRishon had waited, uh, the lesson too, it's, it's Baruch, it's clear, in Kabbalah, this is the way it was supposed to have happened. If Adam HaRishon had just waited three more hours until Shabbos came in, even a little less because it tells us, it tells us Shabbos, and, but until Shabbos came in, the Eitzadas Tovara would have been transformed into an Eitzachayim, and then it would have been a mitzvah of the Raisa to eat from the Eitz Das Tovah because it comes after the Eitz Chaim. The mistake was not the eating of the Eitz Das Tovah The mistake was eating from the Eitz Das Tovah before eating from the Eitz Chaim. So the person gets the Nun Shari Bina, and they they get that back when they they eat from the Eitz Chaim first. So then, when they get to the twenty, now the natural world that usually hides end of a Kush Baruch Hu, it's Magala instead. You get the Hecho. And then once you get that and that, the 50 plus the 20, what do you end up at? The Parochus. What's the, what's the total of that? 70. Right? 50 plus 20 is 70. The Parochus, Amakum, as Lamalim and Teva. And that's the whole poem right there. It's the whole poem progression from the beginning until the end. The reason why the 70, the 70 years specifically, why it evolves around the 70 years, and why the fact that we have to drink wine specifically corresponds to that, the Kamash of Sod, it's all to do with the same idea. It's very, very significant because it's very much applicable to us today. Because, I have to tie it back in again, but uh, there's a few questions, you know, more questions to be asked to unlock the whole, the whole idea, but the, uh, I'll just, I'll just, just um, yeah, and I stick it, it's all to be seen, a lot of things to say at one time. Um, Well, first, first, there's a story, you know, a beautiful story that really kind of like is an overview of everything and the idea. It helps to appreciate what Purim is all about, and then we'll you know, go back and put the pieces in and, and build the story from there. Somebody once asked for Hutner, the Tzal, what the point of drinking on Purim was all about, right? What was, the, what was the idea behind the drinking? So he brought a mashal, very beautiful mashal, and it's one of these stories that once you hear it, you know, I've used this story over and over again, I think it's one of the most beautiful stories I've ever heard, and especially in terms of the limu that it comes to give over. And the story basically he says, imagine two boys growing up in a shtetl, you know, a couple hundred years ago, a long time ago before railway was so popular, and certainly before you had you know, strong and, and effective forms of communication, and they grew up in a, st- a small shtetl, best of friends from the beginning. They got to hit it together, they learn, they play together, and uh, they become very close. They go to Yeshiva Katana because it's all local, you know, in the shtetl over here. 
But they get to the age of the tender age of 17, 18 years of age, it comes time to get married. And a lot of times people are poor and finding <coughs> the right shalach where you can, your son can remain in learning longer, so you, you're prepared to go all across Europe. The Shadchanim, somehow, even before there was good communication, had good connections all across Europe. As the story goes, what happens basically, the two friends, they, they find their Shadduchim, but one has to go all the way to the east, and one has to go all the way to the west. And the time comes and, you know, and is moving there with everything they have, and the idea of coming back to visit is a very remote possibility because it's very expensive and long distances, and who knows if they'll be there at the exact same time. So they say they're, they're fond farewells to each other, knowing that that might be the last time, or second last time, they'll see each other the rest of their lives. And it's very hard, very hard, but that's what we have to do. They move away, one goes to get married to his wife, one gets married to his wife, and uh, sure enough, the, the days go by, and the weeks go by, and the months go by, and in the beginning they write to each other, it takes a long time before the letters arrive, uh, that was a good thing, they had email in those days, Baruch Hashem. And the, it does, you know, they, they lose touch, they lose touch with each other as time goes on, and the decades go by. You now they get, they, they have families by now, and they're, they're both advancing and they're learning. They hear, you know, bits and pieces of each other through the, you know, through whatever great fight existed at that time, but nothing that they could really you know, hold on to and have much of an understanding of what each other's life was all about. There's really no photographs were being passed back and forth the entire time. They grew apart from each other. They built their own families. And that's just the way it is. There's times in life we have to just move on because, because you just can't carry all the baggage with you all through the years. Sometimes you get lucky. It's an amazing thing. There's people I remember who, who I lost touch with a long, long time ago. And for some reason they popped into my mind. You know, just some memory. And I wondered what they were doing. And lo and behold, on some trip I go back to visit my family or someplace I go to speak. In fact, just, just today I was thinking about somebody in Pittsburgh who I went to a speaking trip years ago, and I'm not exactly sure why he came to my mind. I thought to myself, you know, I wonder what he's up to. He moved, he stayed. He wrote me an email today. Right. <laughs> after like about ten years, it was about ten years. No, it, like it's almost like the broker here and said, "Oh, you're asking that question. I'll help you. I'll, I'll give you the information you want." But anyhow, the story goes on. They moved away from each other, and they lost touch with each other. And about uh, 20, 30, 40 years passed before they they you know even had cause to travel. Anywhere, and by now they have the long beards. You know, Yosef's brothers didn't recognize him because when he left at the age of seventeen, he didn't have a beard. By the age of twenty-nine, he had a beard. You know, how much, how different can you look? Well, it depends on the beard that you have. You know, it was like it's a big, huge, you know, beard with white hair. And the last time you saw someone, they were much younger. You can, you could not, you know, face gets older, you know, wrinkles and all that, and wearing long black coats and hats, the whole thing. Anyhow, they both had to be in Vienna at the same time without knowing it. And literally, and this is what happens in life, it's a Shkachar story, especially with Holocaust survivors, the stories here are unbelievable. And they were walking by each other, and as they walked by each other, right, there was a sense of recognition that beyond the norm, you know, you don't, how, how would I recognize a person after not seeing for such a long period of time? But they did, and then you walk by each other, and somebody says, stop, stop and turn around. And they both stopped and turned around and looked at each other, and, and one goes, it's Moshe, is that you? He goes, David, is that, is that you? He goes, I can't believe it. They run, they, they, they run to each other, they, they embrace each other, they hang on to each other, they you know, can't let go because who knows how, how long this is going to last for. And they literally, like, holding on to each other, they walk sideways to the bench in the train station, and they sit down, they go, tell me about your wife, your family, your kids, and I heard that, but the whole story. And after five minutes of catching up on so many details, they hear, hmm, right, train's going, train's going. And, uh, you know, he turns and says, where are you going? going east or west? And he says, I'm going west. He says, which way are you going? I'm going east. He goes, I can't believe it. After all these years, only five minutes, how, could it, how is it possible that there's so much to say, so much to catch up on? Who knows when we'll see each other another time? This is, it's, I can't accept this. What am I going to do? I can't miss our train. Our families are waiting for us. And who knows when the next train is going to come along? So Moshe says to David, he says, I got an idea. I bought this bottle of wine. Yeah, he's here, you know, Wine like this is not available everywhere you know, we come from. But I bought this bottle of wine. I bought it for Shabbos, but I think it's going to hold your purpose right now. I have a glass. I'll take the bottle, give you a glass full of wine. You go to your conductor. I'll go to my conductor, and we'll get them drunk, and no one's going anywhere for a good hour. That's the mushroom. It was the Nimsha. I mean, fat chance you'll get the conductor to drink in a real-life train situation and lose his job. 
But the Masha is the Masha. What's the Nimsha? What's the story? He says, people come into this world as Neshamas, right? Neshamas is Nun Shama, right? There mm-hmm. is the Nun Shari Bina. That's what the Neshamas are. But that book, basically, now with Nun Shari Bina. You come into this world as a Neshama. Before you were born, before you were born, all that mattered to you was connection to Kodesh Baruch. You know you signed a contract, right? The Gemara Nida says you signed a contract before you're born. I will be a Tzadik in my lifetime. So if you're not, I'm going to sue you later on. Right? And they are good lawyers. Shemai. They're the best, right? Not the ones you see down here. The real yeah. ones, right? And and it's all you want to be, it's a You want to be close to Kodesh Baruch Hu's all that counts. You're not interested in Gashmis whatsoever. Chet does not entertain you at all. All you want to do is learn Torah and learn Torah and connect to Kodesh Baruch Hu and connect to other Neshamas. That's the whole thing. When you're first born, that's exactly what you do. Kids, they're not thinking about, you know, you know, uh, you know what, what, how they appear, clothing, cars are going to drive. <clears throat> they don't, you know, competition in that respect. You know, they may be a little getting used to other people in the world besides yourself, right? But it's a whole different reality. That's why children have such shame. Because they come into this world with the shamas. And then you start to grow up. Ah, oh, you start to grow up. The good old years, right? You start to become an, an adolescent. And you start worrying about things like complexions and, you know, and, and, and you know, appearances and, and, and competing and all these things. Then you become a teenager and it becomes more difficult. And then you become an adult. The adult has to worry about supporting himself and supporting his family. There's the bills, the taxes, and there's the wars. And you, you, there's so much going on in the world that basically your neshama gets tighter and tighter and more compact until eventually it's like in prison. Can't get out. Can't get out. The Shamas don't... What was the last time you talked to a person like a soul? It's an amazing thing. We, talk, we look at each other, and theoretically, I know that the, the essence of who you are is a soul, but we talk to each other as bodies. <coughs> <clears throat> we treat each other as bodies. We deal in the physical world. Siddiquim and Gedolim had the capacity to look past the body and see the Neshama. I've seen this, you know, first experience. We go and you, like, they just look right past the body and they can see the Neshama. But the rest of the world, for the most part, is very Gashmi. Even people who are Ruchani, it's more theoretical than actual. Because that's life in this world. It's a very worrying world. There's so much going on. To take, just that bit of Muna takes a major effort of concentration and focus. So Kosh Baruch Hu says, once a year, get the conductor drunk. But we're not talking, what's the point of a conductor where basically you're going to say, you know, you know, you know, get the conductor drunk and he drives the train off the rail. You know, he kills him in the process. What, what, did, I, what did I accomplish by that? Which we have to understand what it means, Adeluyad, Dabein, Baruch, Mordechai, and Araham, and specifically why those particular people, why that specific way, what's going on, what's the message behind it as well, because Adeluyad can't mean, we never, ever, ever as a people sanction a lack of consciousness. Never. There's never a reason for it. You know, after death, maybe it's a good story, but while we're living in this world, the whole point is to get to high levels of consciousness. And it has to be that way. Why? Because Chazal tells only two holders won't be battled the Mata Mashiach. And even Tachir Samesi. Right? It goes, as history goes on, holders become battled. We spoke about this before. Why did they become battled? Because the light that the holy represents, that allows you to access in this period of history, belongs to another period of time. So Hanukkah is the first holy to go because Hanukkah is the light of Yemosa Mashiach. We spoke about that, right? Remember? So when Yemosa Mashiach, every day is Hanukkah. You don't need Hanukkah anymore. It's an eight-day holiday to access the light. In Tehir amazing. Pesach goes, and Shvuz goes, and Sukkot goes, because every day, those lights shine in Tehir amazing. Then, then after that, Shabbos goes next, because every day, in, from 6,000 to 7,000, is Yom Shukul Shabbos. Every day is Shabbos, in, in Olam Abba. And after that, Yom Kippur goes next. And the last holiday to go, of all the Chagim, oh, yeah. it's boring. the last holiday, even in Olam Abba, can you imagine this? But there's no food, there's no drinking, there's no eating, things like that. Even in Alam Haba, Purim is still a holiday until the <coughs> ninth, whatever that means, millennium. So it can't be about Stam. You know, simply getting drunk and losing consciousness. That's not what it's going to be like later on. You can't be accessing the light that way of the world to come. So the question becomes, another question becomes, so therefore why is there a Mishta and not a Suda? Every other holiday we have a suit. There's nothing it's a mishta by Chagim. Only by one holiday. It's a mishta. Right? And the Gemara, hmm? 
And the Gemara, right, which not to be confused with Vashti. Vashti means and to drink. <coughs> What's right? the difference between Suda and Mishnah? Suda is, is like we do on Shabbos, just there's no there's no there's no end of drinking per se. They drink in, the Mishnah is a drinking feast. Drink. It's yeah. a drinking feast, and a Suda is like a is like a kind of like Suda a meal you make to elevate the experience of the holiday itself, to bring simch and only things like that, right? Whatever wine you drink, you know, and, and whatever you have is just basically part of the experience, but it's not specifically what you're doing. Like a Mishnah, the meat things like that by pouring it, it centers around the drinking itself. It's a drinking feast. <laughs> Mishnah really has a negative connotation for the most part. Now, just to finish off for today, more and more cotton, um, Tess Ahmed Allah was speaking about one specific Yom Kippur. And, that, and Yom Kippur, of course, we're always taught Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, right? And it's not just a play on words, it's not just a play on words. No, it is a play on words, but it's a very specific play on words that has specific meaning to it. Yom Kippur was called Yom Kippur before Purim was ever holiday. But there is an idea of Yom Kippur, which is why. <coughs> Purim is the second last holiday to go, and then Purim is the last holiday to go. The Gemara in Mordechai says, which is, which? Hmm? "Which is the second last and the last?" The second last is Yom Kippur, yeah. and the last is Purim itself. So it can only be Yom Kippur. Whereas Purim is not like Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is like Purim itself. <laughs> you know, it's, somehow there's a very strong correlation, but they seem so different from each other. Yom Kippur is a fast day. You don't eat on Yom Kippur, and on Purim you dafke eat, and you eat in a way that's not even like you do on Shabbos. Complete extreme opposites. I love this aspect of Torah. I love all of Torah, but this part the best. But this is the juiciest part. We have seemingly incredible contradiction, but in there lies the sort of everything. You solve that mystery, and you solve everything, or a good part of everything in the end. So there's one good more. There's always a clue. There's always a clue, and it always astounds me how it can be so blatant, and yet so many people don't even pay attention to these things and even use it in any positive way. But the Gemara Malkatan says there was one unique Yom Kippur in the history of the Jewish people. It happened in the year that Shlomo HaMelech finished building the Beis HaMikdash. Beis HaMikdash, Mishkan, right? The Gemara in Erevin, the first daf, points out they're interchangeable, not just in terms of words, but conceptually the, Mish- the Beis HaMikdash, really the Mishkan was the forerunner of the Beis HaMikdash. There was always going to be a Beis HaMikdash. Not always going to be a Mishkan, but always going to be a Beis HaMikdash. But the Mishkan is the Mikdash, the Mikdash is the Mishkan, is the same idea. He finishes the base of Mikdash 480 years after Yitzhak Misraim. And you now we Jews are always looking for excuse to eat. You know, like, as, a, as the joke goes, we came, we conquered, let's eat. Right? That's, you know, it's always a Suda to somehow celebrate that, uh, you know, whatever we were accomplishing over there. So they came to Shulman Malach and said to him, Don't. Finish the base and make this just yet. Hold off with a few more bricks before doing that, because if you do, we'll have to make a seum. And knowing you, being the king, Shlomo Malach, you want to make a two-week seum. It happens to be Rosh Hashanah. Two weeks will take us to Sukkot. We'll have, a, we'll have to make a decision over the year, either to skip one day and do Yom Kippur, or Chas V'chalila, Chas V'chalila, eat on Yom Kippur. Ain't the Varkazah. We know that the midst of the rice, how could you possibly eat on Yom Kippur? So Shlomo Malach said, he said, well, we don't hold off. The other halach over here, we don't hold off on a seum. Like, for example, during the nine days, it works out, not that you planned it, but it works out that you finish a mesef or something during the nine days, and you are ready to make a seum, go ahead, b'vakashah, make a seum, and have meat and wine. It actually happened to me one year. That's what you have to do. So he says, no, the, I didn't plan it this way. The base of mikdash is ready to be completed now. We're not going to hold off. Who knows, but chas we hold off another day, what might possibly happen? To change the world. This is a, a momentous occasion. Let's complete it now. And we'll have our two week seum in celebration of the completion of the base of Mikdash. And they do exactly that. And they go ahead and they eat on Yom Kippur. And they have charata, because you know, eating on Yom Kippur, even for a mitzvah, is not easy to do. And Koba Chomer at a party. At least a person who does it because they're ill. It's papachet and yira, and you know, regret the whole thing, and you've got a support system around because no one's eating around them. You know, so there's a certain mitzvah that keeps you intact to make sure you're eating properly. Little shot glasses. We're very medactic about this. But to do this part of a seum, okay, folks, the most solemn day of the year, we're about to have Yom Kippur, and we're going to celebrate that solemn day and do tshuva and kippur and all that, and fight for our lives by having a big happy suda. That's a mishnah. Okay, you're know, the king. You know, you say so, right? And they do it, and they felt bad. Maybe Chas they made a terrible mistake. A boss call comes out and says, 
the entire generation is muchan lechayel ha'olami. Now, if you're lucky. If you get through a Yom Kippur and they say you're muchan to another year of life, you're doing pretty good. Tell Alam Haba, how do you know? Maybe the rest of your life you might you know. How do you know? No, well, right now, this generation <coughs> that ate on Yom Kippur this year is going to the world to come. So let's all do that. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Right? Pouring is for the rest of you. Right? This experience is the highest pouring experience you could possibly have. So it's not the fasting on Yom Kippur that makes the difference. That's not the issue. It's just that on our level, we have to. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the halacha of bittel barov. Right? The halacha of bittel. Three pieces of meat get mixed together. Two are kosher. One is treif. What's the halacha? Midderaisa, you can eat all three. What about the fact that one's vaday treif? Okay, but it's not nikar. He didn't do it purposely. The halacha, because Rabbi's kaveh halacha. He says you can eat all three. Come along to Rabbi and say, don't do it though. Only eat two. Well, maybe only eat one. Okay, but there's still a 30% chance. But that, we'll, we'll live with that, that, that possibility. <laughs> so the question is, I don't understand. <laughs> if the Torah says you can do it, why the right but you can't do it? Because on the level that we're living, when we're eating all three pieces of meat, what's going to go through our mind? When we're eating kosher meat? No. The Torah permits me to have a piece of treif meat. When a chola eats treif meat to survive, to save himself, it's not called treif anymore. For him. Because the Kosh is in that situation. What is treif? Treif is what a Kosh calls treif. She's a woman who's ushered to her brother-in-law until it turns out her husband dies, leaving no children. She was ushered, and now not only is it mutter, it's a mitzvah. We even humiliate him if he doesn't do Hebrew in the end. Because the Kosh is Kovea, the reality. So we can't do Yom Kippur like it was done that year. If you could... That's the way it should be celebrated. And that's the way it will be celebrated in the Lama Ba, in the end. In the meantime, to get you to that point, you do pouring. We can't even do pouring properly yet. But I haven't been pouring properly. What's, what's going on? What's the whole idea of the Mishnah? What are we supposed to accomplish over there?